Okay, the, the title of this topic uh, today is Establishing the Diagnoses of Well-Differentiated Liposarcoma, Atypical Lipomatous Tumor, or ALT, and distinguishing that from de-differentiated liposarcoma. Uh, it's also important that we at, uh, at least begin a discussion on when molecular testing is cost-effective and appropriate. Uh, I think a lot of younger trainees tend to basically jump straight to molecular testing when they're unsure of the diagnosis or uh, feel uh, less confident establishing the diagnosis. And I hope after this talk today, I'll give you some ideas about how you can establish this diagnosis uh, with and without molecular findings and when is the cost worth uh, the actual investment. Um, before we start, let's talk about some definitions. I think the first definition we should talk about is related to uh, what do we mean when we say typical lipomatous tumor and well-differentiated liposarcoma? Well, you should know that these designations have been around for quite some time. Um, for the most part, we consider these terms to be synonymous. Uh, that is, well-differentiated liposarcoma is synonymous with that designation of atypical lipoma or atypical lipomatous tumors. Not just referring to a funny-looking fatty tumor, but it refers to a lesion that may locally recur, and very importantly, in the absence of dedifferentiation, will not metastasize. But I, I would also add that it's important to note that this designation is based on the fact that it can dedifferentiate. And that's really the principal reason why we have to separate it from other lipomatous tumors that do not dedifferentiate and therefore cannot acquire the ability uh, to metastasize. Now, back when I was a resident, these designations of separation were sometimes used uh, to separate what we now know as biologically the same tumor, but in different locations. And it was predicated on the fact that when you saw it, for example, in the extremities or moreover in the subcutis, it was far less likely to differentiate. And in some cases, almost unheard of metastasizing. But when it arose in more central locations, uh, the, the, the behavior was more likely to be that of a malignancy. And thus, the designation atypical lipoma was sometimes applied to those superficial lesions and intramuscular lesions and well-differentiated liposarcoma was applied uh, to those centrally located lesions with greater uh, malignant potential. But again, we know that really we're talking about the, the same tumor um, uh, occurring with the same biology and the same cytogenetic abnormalities. So let's talk a little about the clinical features. Uh, we're gonna talk a, a, about atypical lipomas, tumor ALT, and well-differentiated uh, liposarcoma, WDL. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about this tumor, uh, the spectrum of this tumor, how we establish the diagnosis and how molecular has changed the way we establish this diagnosis. Uh, first of all, we know that most examples, the vast majority of examples of uh, ALT occur in older adults. Most commonly deep soft tissues, especially extremities and uh, central locations like the retroperitoneum and mediastinum. We also know, we're gonna go over this in more detail, that these tumors have reproducible cytogenetic abnormalities, uh, most commonly ring or giant marker chromosomes, and that as a result of these uh, cytogenetic abnormalities, there are, uh, there, there are proteins and DNA that are amplified that we can also test for to help establish a diagnosis. Um, and as I've already mentioned, there is an increased risk of local recurrence with these lesions and the potential for metastasis if they de-differentiate. De um, now, let's talk a little bit about the clinical on this, um, which uh, I will say that in some cases this has evolved, uh, but in general, if anybody tells you they can reliably distinguish all cases of atypical lipomatous tumor from lipoma, I would say they're sadly mistaken. I mean, typically on MRIs, like you see here, and these are two different patients with two uh, right posterior thigh masses, uh, typically you'll see a, a lesion that has similar signal intensity uh, as that seen with normal subcutaneous fat. Um, and this is sort of where um, uh, radiologists can suggest that this is a largely fatty tumor. Beyond that, if they see varying levels of signal intensity, that may suggest something more but in reality, areas of, of fatty necrosis, uh, areas of fibrosis can occur in both ALTs and lipomas. And uh, for all practical purposes, imaging is only useful for suggesting that it's a largely fatty tumor. Um, 
we are going to get the de-differentiation, and I will say that's one area where they can be very helpful, particularly if you're sampling this with small biopsy specimens and helping direct uh, radiologic guided needle biopsy to those areas that are more likely to be uh, higher grade. But beyond that, I, it, you know, overall imaging is generally not that helpful in helping establish the diagnosis. And just for reference sake, the one on the top is a turned out to be a large lipoma, and the one here on the bottom, the small little slithered uh, uh, fatty tumor, is actually an ALT. Okay, so um, gross characteristics of these tumors, again, um, there are no absolute features that, that help establish this diagnosis, but we do look for things that should cause you concern and make you uh, think about sampling this to a little bit greater extent. Uh, if you look at this tumor, it's largely composed of yellow mature fatty tissue, but it's intersected by strands, very, really sized strands and septa of this kind of white scar-like tissue. And when you see this type of phenomenon, this should alert you to the fact that this could be something more than simply a, a lipoma. That translates to very characteristic features microscopically. If you look at this lesion at low power, the first thing you notice is there is a lot of adipocytes, right? A lot of mature adipocytes. Um, but these adipocytes show a lot of heterogeneity, both in their size and their shape. And that heterogeneity is largely due to the fact that there is an increased amount of non-fatty tissue in the background. And when I see this on gross, as, as I showed you earlier, or I see this on microscopic, uh, as you see now, I get worried that this is something more than an ordinary lipoma. And if you go down on a little bit higher power on this, and I think the illustration on the right is what we more classically see, what you really are looking for are these large, atypical, hyperchromatic, often multinucleated, what I call stromal cells, uh, that are more commonly seen in these fibrous areas, but are also seen uh, adjacent to adipocytes as well. Um, and, and interestingly, you'll also see these in, in muscular wall blood vessels fairly frequently, but it's these cells uh, that most of us consider characteristic of ALT, well-differentiated liposarcoma. Now, if you're lucky, and I say lucky because if, if you wait to try to find these to establish a diagnosis of ALT, uh, you'll miss a lot of cases of ALT. If you're lucky, you may also see lipoblasts. And what, what are lipoblasts, really? Well, essentially, lipoblasts are these multivacuolated tumor cells here that show a scalloping or an indentation to a hyperchromatic nucleus. And you notice they're, they're very variable. You don't see the uniform vacuolation that you typically, or granularity that you typically expect in a hibernoma, but instead, variably sized vacuoles. The nucleus is often not centrally located, but paracentrally located. And this is a classic lipoblast. Again, this picture on the left side is far less common than this picture on the right side, and we shouldn't depend on the finding of lipoblast to establish the diagnosis of ALT. It's not needed. If you find this kind of morphology, morphologic features on the right side, you've got your diagnosis. We'll talk a little bit more about that uh, momentarily. Okay, we also need to make the point that well-differentiated uh, liposarcoma may also occur in the subcutes. It's relatively rare, but I show this illustration just to show you an example of a mature fatty lesion here in the subcutis extending into the deep dermis. And when you look at it at higher power, you see these atypical hyperchromatic, often multinucleated cells, both adjacent to fat and also within this fibrous tissue itself. So it can occur here. It tends to be relatively rare. And there have been rare examples of de-differentiation documented in the literature. Thus, we think of it as basically the same thing, but with a less potential for aggressive behavior. Now, um, there exist some classic subtypes of atypical lipomas tumor slash WDL, right? The one we've been talking about and the one that's by far and away the most common is the lipoma-like. And of course, it's called that because the majority of the tumor consists of mature adipose tissue resembling lipoma. But there also exist tumors that can be composed almost exclusively of fibrous tissue and sometimes fibrous tissue with a prominent inflammatory component. And thus the, the categories of sclerosing and inflammatory well differentiated liposarcoma. Now it's important to make this point, and that is that 
this, there's no prognostic relevance in identifying lipoma lice gross or inflammatory. And if you look at enough of these, you'll notice that you may find proportions of any of these t subtypes in any given tumor, and the designation is largely based on which one is the, the is it represents the majority of the volume of that tumor. But it has no prognostic relevance at all. The only important point is to recognize it as a low-grade liposarcoma or ALT that has the potential to locally recur and, and, and de-differentiate. De so what does sclerosing look like? Well, the classic example of sclerosing liposarcoma is a tumor composed predominantly of mildly cellular to very hypocellular dense fibrous tissue. And you can see on the left side this sort of, inter this sort of uh, intermediate power uh, picture that we have some lipoblasts that are present within here in fat, but you can see large areas that are devoid of fat. And that can be especially problematic in small biopsy specimens. But again, notice these still, you still see these hyperchromatic atypical stromal cells that in this case are exclusively in dense fibrous tissue in a very hypocellular lesion. I will tell you in practice that even if you see this, this picture on the right in a core needle biopsy, it's almost always well-differentiated liposarcoma, even if you do not see any adipocytes uh, whatsoever. I mean, if you think about it, the differential here would really include something like undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma, but undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma, unless it's post-treatment, should never be this hypocellular. So if you see this type of finding, uh, this hypocellular but pleomorphic uh, tumor, particularly if it's in a retroperitoneal uh, you know, or intra-abdominal location, I want you to strongly consider the idea that this is a well-differentiated sclerosing liposarcoma. Now, inflammatory liposarcoma, to my eye, and just from a simplistic standpoint, looks a lot like a sclerosing liposarcoma, except that it has large amounts of inflammatory cells in the background, principally lymphocytes, sometimes plasma cells. But again, what are you looking for? These atypical, hyperchromatic, often multinucleated stromal cells are the key to establishing this diagnosis. I should say that, that almost all examples of sclerosing and, and inflammatory liposarcoma will have lipoma-like areas within, within them but these may not be in the samples that you receive for your biopsy. So it's important to actually consider this diagnosis. Uh, interestingly enough, um, some of you may uh, have already come to this conclusion that one of the things that can arise in the differential diagnosis of inflammatory liposarcoma is Hodgkin's disease. So you have to, and I have seen this differential. I have seen cases that were thought to be well differentiated inflammatory liposarcoma that later turned out to be Hodgkin's disease, and I've seen vice versa. So be, bear in mind that, that that differential may be something that's entertained um, uh, in a small biopsy specimens in particular. But again, none of these have any prognostic relevance. Now, we've also known for quite some time that the, the spectrum of atypical lipomas tumor extended beyond these subtypes. It wasn't just limited to sclerosing, inflammatory, uh, and lipoma-like, but other fatty tumors could have other features. And again, it was important to basically recognize these as ALTs, not overcall them as a higher grade sarcoma because their, morph their, their, biologi their biology and clinical outcome was similar. Uh, one of the best papers I've heard on this topic, and I, and I would suggest that um, if you don't have this paper or are not familiar with it, that you obtain this paper because it's an excellent study uh, by Harry Evans at MD Anderson on the, vari the variations of atypical lipomatous tumor in various combined forms. It talks about the distinction of dedifferentiated liposarcoma, which we'll talk about shortly. And one of the things I like about Dr. Evans' approach is when you read his papers, you'll notice that he often produces studies. Uh, they're not the largest number of cases, but his cases have very good long-term follow-up. And when you're talking about a low-grade lesion like atypical lipomatous tumor, you need at least five years follow-up. And I would venture to say, if you really want to get uh, good clinical data, you need 10 years or more. And this is one of the values of this paper. So some of the spectrum of these changes uh, that you can see in ALT include over here on the left-hand side, cases which can resemble a high-grade mix of fibrous sarcoma, um, cases that are more cellular, as you see here in the, middle, in the middle screen, and cases that may even 
uh, have areas of, of heterologous uh, differentiation, for example, cartilage or even osteoid, which may be present. Again, you'll notice that these atypical stromal cells and lipoblastic cells are present throughout all of these lesions. Again, the important point is to recognize this as ALT and not try to diagnose a higher grade sarcoma and the implications of, of therapy that does not match the biology of the tumor. Now, um, as you know, and most of you probably know this, in my time, when I was a resident and fellow, uh, we were basically at a, at a stage where we were starting to discover specific chromosomal abnormalities and translocations in a variety of different tumors. And there was at that time a group of researchers that included Chris Fletcher and Juan Rosai uh, called the Chromosomes and Morphology Collaborative Study Group. And this group produced a lot of seminal articles that are still referenced today. And one of the things that they looked at was they looked at lipomatous tumors as a group and discovered that these tumors, including atypical lipoma, pleomorphic spindle cell lipoma, lipoblastomas, hibernomas, et cetera, had specific chromosomal aberrations. In regards to atypical lipoma, which is the illustration that you see here on the right, these tumors often produce giant marker chromosomes and ring chromosomes generally associated with amplified DNA from chromosome 12 Q13-15 band. Um, and as we'll talk about momentarily, that led to some amplification of proteins, which we can now detect today. Their early studies showed that anywhere from about two thirds to three quarters of atypical lipomatous tumors had these abnormalities. But remember, cytogenetic uh, karyotypic analysis was, some, was, was limited and its scope and ability to get cells in culture. And thus, now we have even better and more reliable and faster testing for discovering, uh, uh, or at least confirming the diagnosis of atypical lipomatous tumor. So over here on the left, you see immunostochemical stains, and on the right, you see fluorescent and site two hybridization analysis. And basically, now we know that those large giant marker chromosomes, uh, the ring chromosomes that were a result of amplified DNA also resulted in uh, proteins that we could then detect either by immunohistochemistry or fish analysis. Uh, with immunohistochemistry, of course, the most common is MDM2, a little less common that we use a CDK4. And on the left side, this is MDM2 nuclear staining in atypical lipomatous tumors, one that's predominantly fatty and another one that's got a little bit more sclerotic stroma. And over here, of course, is the fish analysis signals for an amplified uh, MDM2. Uh, DNA probe. Now, brings to mind a couple of things we probably should mention. One is that I like immunostochemistry, and immunostochemistry I do use, but it isn't as sensitive as fish, and it's particularly not as sensitive in tumors that are predominantly fatty, and part of the reason is, is because you are looking for those atypical enlarged stromal cells, and when you have a tumor that's predominantly fatty with none of those present, IEC is just not going to be useful. Fish is going to be a better tool for that. For that reason, I rarely use IHC in any situation unless I've got enough nuclei that I feel confident to evaluate it as such. So IHC is best done on more cellular tumors, that is more cellular forms of ALT and certainly on dedifferentiated liposarcomas. Again, we do see equivocal results uh, here and when we see cases in which we're not totally trusting of the IHC, we will take it one step further to fish. But I do often use IHC as a screening test, again, in the more cellular forms of ALT and dedifferentiated liposarcoma. Now, one of the things, one of the outcomes of the molecular world, and, it's, it, and this has changed the face of a lot of tumors that we uh, actually see um, and what we consider to be within that tumor spectrum, was that the molecular testing both reshaped the spectrum and in some cases expanded the, the spectrum of what we could consider within a specific category of tumors. And one area that, that it definitely affected was in the arena of retroperitoneal fatty tumors. When I was coming along as a resident, if you saw a biopsy of a retroperitoneal fatty tumor, whether or not it had atypical cells in it or was diagnosed, diagnostic of uh, atypical lipomas tumor or not, you called it well-differentiated liposarcoma. So we saw cases in which there was just complete sheet, sheet, sheet 
sheets of mature adipocytes like you see here. Uh, no, no obvious atypia at all, but we all knew that sampling was a problem in the retroperitoneum. These tumors locally recurred, they differentiated. No one wanted to take the risk of calling one of these a lipoma, uh, knowing about that um, uh, distinct likelihood and possibility. So the molecular age actually did allow us to confirm the presence of a true retroperitoneal lipoma. And it started with case reports and then a larger series from the Mayo Clinic in which uh, ultimately they looked at 19 tumors without any uh, degree of atypia. They did find rearrangements of chromosome 12 uh, Q15 uh, resulting in a positive HMGA2 rearrangement uh, in many of the cases and all of them were fish negative. And it turned out when they followed these cases that uh, basically there was no evidence of local recurrence or metastasis. So we do know, and, and again, molecular has allowed us to do, to do this, that there is, um, uh, there is the, that, that retroperitoneal lipomas do exist, but of course, I don't think any of us would try to establish this diagnosis in the absence of molecular. But certainly we now have established the fact that, that lipomas in this location may occur and it's prevented us from actually overcalling a malignancy uh, in, 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 in individual patients who have this disease. Okay, so there are a lot of potential pitfalls in the diagnosis of ALT, a well-differentiated liposarcoma. And of course, those in include a lot of things. For example, it's uh, cases that have extensive fat necrosis, and we're not going to get into details about this, dysplastic lipomas, pleomorphic spindle cell lipomas, especially in the usual locations. But I would say even in their usual locations, uh, it can sometimes be difficult. Um, when lipoblastomas occur in adults as opposed to children, that can uh, cause problems in the differential diagnosis. Um, patients who are morbidly obese who develop massive localized lymphedema, uh, that can run into differential. And of course, pitfalls can also occur due to sampling, particularly in small biopsy specimens. So this sort of brings us, now that we've talked about the diagnosis of ALT, and we've talked about what we can use to aid in the diagnosis of ALT. Let's talk about what the literature says regarding when to order molecular studies. And do we have to have them? Okay. So first, let's talk about uh, this particular study, which was, from, um, which was from Mayo Clinic, that looked specifically at extremity-based fatty tumors. They looked at uh, 405 consecutive fatty tumors all of which were analyzed histologically, okay, and then via fish for MDM2. By pure histology alone, these tumors are classified as lipoma 324, intramuscular lipoma 29, and ALT52. Uh, very importantly, there was agreement between the histologic diagnosis and molecular testing in the vast majority of cases, 96% of cases, and ironically, uh, there was a tendency for pathologists to overestimate cytologic atypia. FISH resulted in the reclassification of 18 of these tumors, uh, representing 4% of the total number of tumors. So where were the areas of reclassification occurred? Well, as I mentioned earlier, the biggest problem was overcalling. So we had 11 cases of ALT that with FISH analysis were found to be ordinary lipomas. And among that group of tumors, none of those developed local recurrences. We go back over here to uh, the, the below this to the seven ordinary lipomas were reclassified uh, via fish analysis as atypical lipomatous tumors, well differentiated liposarcomas. Now, within this group, there's some important points that we should make, and that is that uh, among the seven tumors, six of these tumors were really large, they were greater than 15 centimeters. And often, and all of, all of these six tumors that were greater than 15 centimeters were deeply located. It's also important to point out that two of these tumors locally recurred. So what were the final conclusions on this? Well, the conclusions on this were as expected. Pathologists tend to overestimate atypia via morphology, but in most cases we're right based on morphology, right? But we, if we're gonna be wrong, we're gonna tend to overestimate atypia. They recommended molecular fish testing for the following. And again, this pertained only to extremity tumors. Tumors that relapsed or recurred um, could, should be tested. Tumors with equivocal atypia should be tested. And as expected, because we had seven ordinary lipomas, it turned out to be ALTs uh, by fish analysis, but that diagnosis could not be established on histology alone. And six of those were larger than 15 centimeters. The recommendation was that large, greater than 15 centimeter tumors should also be tested. 
it's important to sort of understand that this study looked only at resection specimens. Okay? There were no core needle biopsies analyzed here. There were only resection specimens, and all of them were reported initially with negative margins. Now, this was followed by a, 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 an excellent study from Emory that looked at this from a different standpoint. So if you look at the way Emory at the time uh, was diagnosed, was, was, dis, was making a decision on when do they order MDM2, they had already established, from what I could tell from the paper, uh, that fish analysis was going to be performed in certain problematic situations. And those situations were defined as follows. You see that list here. Uh, fatty tumors that were greater than 10 centimeters, those that contained equivocal, not definite atypia, uh, relapsing or recurrent fatty tumors, and all retroperitoneal pelvic and intra-abdominal fatty tumors, regardless of whether they had atypia or, you know, or not, um, were also analyzed as well as cases with worrisome radiologic features. And by that, I mean mostly heterogeneity uh, that we talked about earlier in imaging. So they looked at 301 consecutive cases in which they had ordered fish analysis uh, based on these problematic uh, situation because they wanted to kind of they wanted to, to basically discover which of these problematic situations represented a situation that they would recommend we should be doing. I mean, it's what Emory's doing, but it may not be what other institutions are 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 doing at that time. So, among the 301 cases in which the diagnosis could not be established via morphology alone, it's an important point to make. Turned out that a a little over a third of these cases turned out to be ALTs, well-differentiated liposarcomas. And then they looked at the incidence of these features. So the, the most common feature for which they ordered uh, fish analysis on was, was tumor size. There were 187 tumors that were greater than 10 centimeters in size, and it turns out a little over a third of those turned out to be ALT. So probably the most sensitive was tumor size. But there were more specific criteria. For example, those that had equivocal atypia, which would represent, you know, 145 of, of, of the cases of, of, of the 301 cases, turned out 72 of those were ALTs. If you looked at recurrent tumors, it turned out that 33 of this group were actually recurrent tumors. More than half of those were ALTs. And if you looked at the retroperitoneal pelvis and abdominal group, again, about a third of, the, of that group represented ALTs. Another important point, among the atypical lipomatous tumors, they were consistently in patients greater than 50 years of age. There was only one example that was superficial subcut subcutaneous in origin, and none of them involved the hands and the feet. None, none of them were acral. What were their conclusions? Well, first and very importantly was that most examples of ALT and well-differentiated liposarcoma can be diagnosed by histologic criteria, which, this was exact quote from them, include mature fat punctuated with large atypical hyperchromatic cells, those, those hyperchromatic stromal cells I mentioned to you previously. And then they recommended molecular fish testing for the following. Recurrent lesions, so any fatty tumor that was a recurrent lesion they tested, even if it had been called lipoma originally deep extremity lesions that were greater than 10 centimeters and in patients greater than 50 years of age, cases with equivocal atypia, and lesions in the retroperitoneum pelvis and abdomen. It's important to note that this study involved 270 excisions and 31 core needle biopsies. So it wasn't just limited to excisions with negative margins, it also involved small biopsy specimens as well. So how do I translate this into my own personal practice? Um, well, and of course, we all have our own bias, but I'm going to give you an example of kind of how I divide this. So when do I order fish and when do I not? And I want to divide this first into two categories. The first category is when I really think that the HD is diagnostic. And that's sort of the below picture, right? I mean, this is the picture where I've got a, a mature fatty tumor, some you know, increased amounts of fibrous tissue, and I have these large atypical hyperchromatic, often multinucleated cells. So if I see an HD &E that looks like that, okay? And uh, basically, it's not involving the subcutis of the head and neck. Let's say it's intra-abdominal, deep muscular. I don't do any other study. I call that atypical lipomatous tumor, right? I, and I think, I think most of my colleagues would, would completely agree with that assessment. Really, the only exception that I make in terms of whether I order ancillary studies 
are lesions that are involving the subcutaneous of the head and neck, the upper back, shoulder, in which the differential diagnosis includes a pleomorphic spindle cell lipoma. Um, in that category of, of of tumors, if it's superficial, a lot of times the only thing I might do is order a CD34 immunostain, and sometimes I might add an MDM2 IHC on that, provided it's cellular enough to, to be able to pick up the stain. And I have had it rare examples to where maybe it was a deeper lesion in that same site. I wasn't quite sure, and I would do MDM2. But really outside of that scenario, if I see an H&E that looks like that bottom picture, I call it a typical lipomas tumor. End of discussion, move on. Now, what about if it's not diagnostic? Suppose I get a fatty tumor with no atypia. I just show you an example of intramuscular lipoma, this lesion down here. And I've seen a number of these over the years. I, I used to, without hesitation, call these intramuscular lipomas when I saw this type of checkerboard pattern. But I've come to recognize that a lot of these, even when I see no atypia, actually turn out to be atypical lipomatous tumors. So this would be an example of a tumor I would say is not diagnostic alone on H&E. So I incorporate a lot of the uh, information uh, from the pre previous two studies that, that we talked about based on size and age. So basically, if I get a mature fatty tumor and there's a deep-seated uh, large tumor, uh, greater than 10 centimeters, for example, in a patient 50 years of age or older, and I can't make the diagnosis on H&E alone, I will fish it, okay? If it's a retroperitoneal, thoracic, abdominal, intra-abdominal tumor, and again, the h &E is not diagnostic, I will fish it. If I look at it and I'm just not sure, it has somewhat equivocal atypia, it's not at the magnitude that I would like or doesn't meet the threshold, my personal threshold that I like to establish a diagnosis, I will fish it. But again, the breakdown here is between the H&E being diagnostic, H&E not diagnostic, and I think that follows the Emory recommendations quite well. So now, the other good news that's happened over the years, many of you who, who, who knew me in, earlier in my career know that I, I really started life doing a lot of final aspirations uh, and cordial biopsies on a whole variety of bone and soft tissue lesions. And what was frustrating back then was you would see a large fatty tumor like you see here, you know, with the same signal intensity as the surrounding subcutaneous fat, and you would do an FNA or core needle, and you get aggregates of this mature adipose tissue, and you were unsure whether you had inadvertently sampled subcutaneous fat or this was, was from the tumor itself. And furthermore, even if it was from the tumor itself, if you didn't see it atypia, you were always, you know, worried, gosh, is this representative of the entire tumor? So for many years, I didn't recommend FNA uh, or core needle on these fatty tumors. And if you got it, you had to realize that it could rule in the diagnosis of atypical lipomatous tumor, um, but it couldn't rule it out. And fortunately, one thing that's happened with uh, our, this age of molecular testing is that it has made small biopsies a viable option. In other words, yes, if I get a core needle biopsy and it shows the distinctive features of ALT, um, just like you saw on that on the previous slide, I'll call it flat out ALT. But in the past, when I just saw fat, mature fat, and I saw no atypia, I was stuck. I didn't have anything else to do but say, well, I can't totally exclude it. Now, that's another situation in which I think fish for MDM2 uh, has really allowed us the ability to to di make this diagnosis regardless of whether we see diagnostic features on H&E, regardless of whether we see those characteristic atypical stromal cells. So that brings us to dedifferentiated liposarcoma. So let's talk a little bit about dedifferentiated liposarcoma. The classic definition of dedifferentiated liposarcoma is that it implies transformation to a high grade, and in the past we would say non-liposarcoma to sarcoma, right? And we're going to update this definition uh, shortly. Um, the, the, the past was basically transformation from a, a low-grade liposarcoma to a high-grade non-liposarcoma sarcoma. But now we have to update this because we now know that that non-liposarcoma to high-grade component, which we always said could look like anything, whether it be rhabdomyosarcoma, lyomyosarcoma, uh, undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma, well, guess what? It can also look like pleomorphic liposarcoma. We're going to talk more about that momentarily. So the classical uh, definition included really only two settings you could establish that diagnosis. 
So basically, the most common way was you needed to see uh, a low-grade liposarcoma juxtaposed to a higher grade non-liposarcoma sarcoma, as I mentioned earlier, right? Or you would see a high grade uh, non-liposarcoma to sarcoma arising in a region in which there was a clinical history of a prior mature fatty tumor, uh, either low grade liposarcoma or God forbid, a lipoma, and now you had a high grade sarcoma. And that was really the only way you could establish that diagnosis, either by history or sampling and making sure you looked at that areas of fat around that tumor. But the molecular age has ushered in another way to establish that diagnosis. And I was skeptical when these early papers started coming out of whether this was really true or not, but it seemed to have held uh, true that you can see dedifferentiated liposarcoma in the absence of the above clinical settings. And you know, again, especially if we're able to prove that it's MDM2 amplified uh, by FISH analysis. And that's important. So why is it important to separate that from other pleomorphic sarcomas, right? Well, I'd say the, probably the most important is surgical margins, because if you've got a dedifferentiated liposarcoma, then that means there is a likelihood that you have a low-grade component. And if you don't recognize the low-grade component, you could mistakenly conclude that the margins are actually negative, when in fact the surgeon is aware that they cut out this large fleshy tumor, but they thought that the fat surrounding it was normal. So I always tell the residents, whenever you're grossing in a sarcoma, make sure you sample that fat around the tumor and let's make sure it's not a dedifferentiated liposarcoma. And I still do that, even though I have other ways of actually establishing a diagnosis, but irregardless, I still have to know whether the low grade component is present. The other one is a little bit more controversial, and that is we do know that the prognosis of dedifferentiated liposarcomas appears better than other similarly staged pleomorphic sarcomas. Now, there is one problem with that. Um, now, I was thinking about that when I was putting together this lecture. One of the problems is in the way we stage dedifferentiated liposarcomas. See, most dedifferentiated liposarcomas are staged, uh, and tumor size, of course, is one of the most important, by the entire tumor size of the specimen. Um, we don't always measure the dedifferentiated component versus a low grade. And sometimes that can be next to impossible, particularly if it's a multicentric, multifocal tumor within the intra-abdominal retroperitoneal region. But that also means that we're probably going to overestimate uh, the biologic potential of that or the malignant potential of that tumor because a 15 centimeter dedifferentiated liposarcoma that has a two centimeter dediff component is not the same as a full 15 centimeter dedifferentiated liposarcoma in which virtually all of it is high grade. I think all of, all of you would agree. Those are two different, two different entities with two different biologic potentials. But since we don't reliably do that on every case that I've seen anyway, um, I think, it's, it, I think it, it stands to reason that that may be influencing the slightly better prognosis that has been reported in the literature of dedifferentiated liposarcoma. So just show you the histology. This is kind of classic dedifferentiated liposarcoma. Um, when you see this, there is no need to do any MDM2 fish testing, right? I mean, over on the left-hand corner, you've got classic low-grade liposarcoma. You can even see the scattered atypical stromal cells, the increased amount of non uh, uh, fatty tissue, and it juxtaposed very sharply to a higher grade pleomorphic spindle cell sarcoma. Now, in most cases, that high grade component essentially looks like an undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma, right? High grade, don't really have any distinguishing features. Immunohistochemistry is not generally helpful unless it's helping you establish a diagnosis of dedifferentiated liposarcoma. And of course, we used to call this in the old days pleomorphic. Uh, spindle cell malignant fibrous histiocytoma, but now we know this as UPS, undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma, and it's important to remember that this diagnosis of UPS is a diagnosis of exclusion, and one of the most important things to exclude is dedifferentiated liposarcoma. So if you see this type of pattern, you know, um, and particularly in deep-seated tumors and especially in intra-abdominal retroperitoneal tumors, always make sure you're not dealing with a dedifferentiated liposarcoma. We also know that dedifferentiated liposarcoma can look like anything, right? I mean, so you can see dedifferentiated liposarcoma with these intersecting bundles, like you see over here, strongly Desmond and SMA positive, Lyomas sarcoma. And you could even see other more, you know, other more pleomorphic and even almost epithelioid lesions uh, 
that may have the immunistic chemical phenotype of a rhabdomyosarcoma. But again, it is all part of the dedifferentiated liposarcoma spectrum. You can also see even less commonly uh, dedifferentiated liposarcoma with chondrosarcomatous elements like you see here on the left and osteosarcomatous elements like you see here on the right. Now, I mentioned this earlier that the old definition of dedifferentiated liposarcoma was that it was a, um, uh, a, a low-grade liposarcoma, atypical lipomatous tumor that transformed into a high-grade non-liposarcomatous sarcoma. And of course, that non-liposarcomatous part of that definition we now know is not accurate because we do know that, a, that the dedifferentiated component not only can it look like osteosarcoma or, or high-grade chondrosarcoma or lyomyosarcoma or rhabdomyosarcoma, it can also be a pleomorphic liposarcomatous component. Right? And one, one of the things that's helped us establish that a subset of these pleomorphic liposarcomas are in fact the differentiated uh, liposarcomas has been the ability to molecular test uh, these tumors looking for MDM2 gene amplification. Now, one thing that's kind of interesting, um, and there's been some controversy on this. You remember in the, in, you know, uh, in the uh, mid to late 90s and early 2000s, there was some discussion about the existence of a low-grade form of dedifferentiated liposarcoma. Um, in reality, I, I have to say I don't really believe in this diagnosis, uh, but I have actually seen it. <laughs> Which, you know, for the most part, I don't think it exists, but I've actually seen it. And, and I think it's because when you look at, again, at enough of these, particularly when you get big, big resections, there's no doubt you can find areas like this in kind of spindly tumors low grade, virtually no mitotic activity in an otherwise higher grade liposarcoma. So the, the fact that you can have regions that exist in these tumors, I think um, begs the fact that there can be low grade dedifferentiated areas. But whether this can exist on its own is somewhat controversial. Most people I know in our field of bone and soft tissue pathology have really begun to question the existence of, of this particular lesion. And that's brought us sort of to this very last but very important point. And that is, how do we differentiate cellular ALT from dedifferentiated liposarcoma? And, you know, probably the best study that I've heard trying to address this was this study from uh, Dr. Harry Evans that we talked about earlier, where he, he first of all, established uh, fairly nicely with, with survival um, that there were other forms of atypical lipomatous tumor beyond the sclerosing form, beyond the inflammatory form, and beyond the more common lipoma-like form. And he established items by basically showing that if you looked at the survival of, of these tumors, it was practically the same. It wasn't statistically different from those uh, that, that we classically recognize as low-grade liposarcomas. And he kind of alluded specifically to the cellular form of atypical lipomatous tumor. And it's, and it's interestingly, when he looked at the follow-up of the cellular form with the more conventional form, there was a difference in survival between those two forms, um, but it wasn't statistically significant. And to be fair to, uh, to my own biases, the cellular form had a median survival of about 142 months, whereas about a 209-month median survival for those that were more conventional. But the important point was the separation between the cellular forms and dedifferentiation. Dedifferentiated liposarcoma had a median survival of around 77 months, right? So we're talking about six years versus over 12 years, you know, uh, in terms of averages for between the cellular form and the dedifferentiated form. So how did he make this separation? Well, when you talk to people in our field, you have a variety of opinions on this topic. And I don't claim to know this, but I do try to use what I, what I think are the best literature supported criteria for this. Um, some people use degree of cellularity, but I find that to be fairly subjective. I mean, how much is too much cellularity? What, how do I define that? Some people will say that if you, if, that you should see, if you see a tumor that has virtually no fat within that tumor, um, then that should be dedifferentiation. But what is the minimal percentage and how do you account for that in small biopsy specimens? Others say, well, um, what about mitotic rate? The classic definition of dedifferentiation included the fact that it needed to have 
at least five mitoses per 10 hot power fields. Again, a fairly objective criteria, at least compared to percentage of fat and degree of cellularity, but this can also be problematic in small biopsy specimens. The answer is I really don't know, but I think in the Harry Evans paper, his principal distinction between dedifferentiated liposarcoma and a cellular ALT was the mitotic rate. And there was a statistically different survival rate for those that had dedifferentiation by this uh, um, utilizing the criteria of mitoses and those that did not. And although the cellular ALTs had a slightly worse survival rate than conventional ALTs, it was not statistically significant. So I, I believe that the bulk of the evidence suggests that mitotic figures are probably the best way to distinguish difficult cases of ALT from dedifferentiation. And this is what I use in my practice. I can tell you that not everybody uses this. A lot of experts out there don't, um, but I think it's the most objective criteria for establishing the diagnosis. It's also important to note that your clinicians may have deferring uh, feelings about this as well. Most clinicians think of dedifferentiation as being high grade and they wanna treat it as such. So if you're going to use lower criteria than this, you probably need to alert your clinicians to the fact that dedifferentiation may not be a high-grade sarcoma, but in my way of thinking, it typically is. What about small biopsies? Well, when I'm in doubt with a small biopsy, and again, keeping in mind, I don't always have the ability in a core needle to do 10 really good high-power fields uh, counting of mitotic figures. I think this is definitely a problem. So when I'm dealing with small biopsy specimens and I encounter this issue, I have said something like in the past, at least atypical lipomatous tumor. And I cannot totally exclude dedifferentiation. I alert the, them to the fact that upon resection, we may see dedifferentiation, but at the present time, I do not. And those patients, I would not recommend getting some sort of neoadjuvant therapy until we established it as a high-grade sarcoma. So that's my summary of ALTs and DDIF for liposarcomas. And I'll leave this with uh, this picture. Um, we're in some difficult times right now. And um, I'm often out with my dog uh, and, or dogs. I have a couple of dogs. And, you know, I, I love this picture because it kind of focuses on what we all should be learning uh, from our animals. And that is um, the dog's happier because the dog is thinking about the present and how happy he is to be with you. And sometimes we get lost thinking about material things and worrying and so forth when I think we'd all be happier when we can focus on the present. Realize that's not always possible. I'm not naive about that, but I just love this picture because it's a reminder for me to sometimes slow down uh, and be happy where I am. Thank you very much.